Hey, what's up? Grandmaster Igor Smirnov is here and I'd like to share with you a game of Magnus Carlsen where he played a series of completely out of these world moves. And what's absolutely amazing about this is that he was only 12 years old at the time. That was a game played by Magnus Carlsen playing white against Dennis Rylander playing black. Both of them were around 2350 in terms of their rating. And let's take a look. So here we're going into the Dutch defense. The first opening moves are more or less normal. Both sides are just developing their pieces. Knight c3, knight c6. Here Carlsen pushed the pawn d5 to attack the knight. Black jumped in the center of the board. This is all still theory, book moves. And Carlsen played pawn e4. Now, of course, the move was played with a bit of delay. It should have been played on move one, but it's still quite strong. <laughs> uh, joke aside, I mean, e4 is one of the good moves for white, obviously, just to get more control in the center of the board. And black played a quite interesting move, pawn f4, offering this potentially a pawn sacrifice, because white can actually capture this pawn. But now Carlson refused to take the pawn with, the, with his bishop. He played another move instead, because if bishop takes a four, there is a number of ways for black to take advantage of this potential discovered attack, and one of them is just to play knight h5, opening up the rook, and also hitting the bishop that way. And once the bishop moves away somewhere, the knight can land on this nice square f4, and this creates some unpleasant potentially situation for the white's king. Because we've got this knight, we've got the rook, you know, the bishop is active along this diagonal. So black is trying to set it up for some attack on the king side. And Carlson didn't want this, so he played another move instead. And in this position, instead of trying to win the pawn, but uh, to get under the potential attack, Carlson said, hey, I don't want to defend, I want to attack myself. And he pushed the pawn in the middle of the board, pawn e5, hitting the black's knight. Uh, the knight went to g4. And now this also hits this pawn on e5 with the knight and with the bishop from g zone as well. Therefore, Carlsen pushed the pawn forward to e6. And now we're getting this interesting position where, on the one hand, what has this really powerful, monstrous pawn chain in the middle of the board, which completely locks the black pieces out of the game, especially the bishop and the queen side rook. Now it's getting very complex for black to get them out. Also, this pawn divides the black's army in two parts, which makes it harder for black to establish harmony. But of course, there is a major drawback here as well. After black played knight e5, we see that this pawn f4 is still alive and it's ready to move forward, and the white's position on the king side becomes quite dangerous. Also, from the e5 square, the knight is attacking this pawn on c4, and because of that, Carlson bravely played pawn c5, actually allowing black to play pawn f3. And even though objectively it was probably a bad decision, but it led to a very interesting game, so let's check this out. After h3 and bishop after f3 and bishop h3, we are get, gaining to the position where, where, you know, something really spectacular starts happening. Black played a very creative move, pawn g5, and we gotta give credit to the black player. He actually plays very decent moves here, very interesting. Now, the idea, of course, is to play g4 and just to win the bishop, because the bishop will be trapped in this case. White cannot, well, white can take the pawn on g5, but it's quite dangerous, because in this case, it opens up this g-file, and black can play queen e8, and after that, the queen can move either to g6, trying to win the bishop and attack, or the queen from e8 can actually land to h5, and from there it can attack both of the white's bishops. And either way, it looks pretty bad for white. So for that reason, Carlson refused to accept this pawn sacrifice once again, but the move that he played is the move that I highly suspect anyone else would play, and the next series of moves is just unbelievable. So Carlson ignored the black's threat of pawn g4, and he played king, g, king to h1, kind of letting black execute black's threat, pawn g4. And now, how would any normal player play, play here? Well, if, if you see that the, the bishop is going to be trapped anyway, I'm pretty sure a lot of players will think, hey, let me try rook g1 so that if the pawn goes there, I can at least, you know, get some activity along the g-file and maybe try to attack somehow. But rook g1 is not the move that Carlson played, and it was a bad move, because instead of opening up the black's king potentially, there was a much stronger option for black to first grab on e6. And doing so forces the trade of queens, after pawn takes, black can trade queens away, and after that, that they can get their back their bishop on h3, and black gets a great position because the black is already a pawn up, the white's pawns are weak, and everything's just great for black. So that just goes to show how white would go down playing the most obvious move here as white. 
So coming back to the actual game here, instead of Rook G1 line that we just analyzed, Carlson played a really strange move, Queen D4. Like it's a strange looking move because not only it allows Black to capture the bishop if Black wants to, but also it puts the bishop, the, the the Queen under the potential discovered attack, which also looks bad for White actually. But anyway, Carlson played this move, Queen D4, and you know I bet not many players would play a move like that. Now after Black took here on H3, Carlson played. Another shocking move. Uh, not long ago I published a video saying about a great game of Mikhail Tal. Uh, and the video title was Only Mikhail Tal can make consecutive sacrifices like that. But I was wrong because apparently Carlson can sacrifice consecutively just as well. And yeah, it's really amazing. He played bishop h6. Putting the bishop under the square where it can easily be captured. And yeah, the point is after that white can capture the knight on e5. So technically speaking, it is not a sacrifice, it is an exchange. But anyway, putting the bishop, you know, where it can be captured in one move is anyway a counterintuitive move. So most players would just not look at this option at all because the score is under the control of the black's piece. So anyway, it takes a lot of creativity to find a move like that. Anyway, black accepted this because what else? Now queen takes e5. So after this exchange, finally white managed to open up the black's king position. And now the plan is pretty simple, play rook g1 check, and it's virtually a checkmate. So black played rook f6 to cover the king. After rook g1, black get, has rook to g6. And actually it's still not over, it's still not easy for white to find a way to, to, to win this game, because black is still pretty solid here on the king side, and black is a piece up. The bishop is ready to play back bishop g7, the king is covered, still not easy. White played queen h5 trying to use this, you know, tackle on the g-file and the queen also is possibly ready to hit uh, this bishop on h6. Black played king g7 to defend it. Now I traded a pair of rooks and played the other rook to g1 so that the pawn is currently pinned. It cannot capture the queen, quite the opposite. The queen wants to capture this pawn now. So black played queen e8 to defend the pawn with their own queen. And now it's once again the position where, okay, white played all the attacking moves he could, but it's unclear what to do next. And Carlson played a calm move 94, just bringing the knight closer, just in case, and planning to somehow develop an attack later. White is still taking advantage of the fact that the black's queen side pieces are kinda out of the game and it takes time for black to bring them. So black plays pawn c6, trying to undermine this pawn, and after that the bishop can take on e6. White played queen e5 check to the king, and after king g8, there is another unusual move. White played knight g5 here, and that's the move which I'm pretty sure many players would not consider, because normally when you're attacking you don't want to allow your opponent to trade pieces, that usually diminishes the power of your attack. But in this case knight g5 is quite strong, even though it allows black to trade their bishop, and also there aren't many other options for white here to develop their attack. Alright, first of all, what's the point of the move knight g5? Well, the point is that the knight is ready to play on f7. So, for example, if black would take here, they didn't in the game, just to show the white's idea. The knight lands there, and it's quite devastating because now queen h8 is coming, also rook takes g6 is coming, so that's clearly deadly for black. That that was the point of the move knight g5. But of course, instead of aligning that, black can just take the knight, which, which is something that they did in the game. Now, bishop takes, queen takes g5, and at first it may seem like white has just too few pieces left on the board to develop any real attack, but it's not quite the case. White is still able to create interesting threats here. Black played king g7 to defend the pawn. By the way, here's a quick question for you. What would happen if black takes this pawn? How would you develop an attack here? Please write it down in the comments below if you can find it. It's you know really interesting position actually. In the game, black didn't take here. He played king g7. And at this point, white played rook g4, just using the rook lift with, again, very limited material available. White wants to rook the lift, uh, lift the rook somewhere here so that they can go queen h6 or queen e5, and together with the rook can create some sort of checkmating attack. Black noticed that some danger is coming there, and he decided to give up the bishop to, you know, at least bring his queen side pieces into the game. And funnily enough, it was not too late for white to mess it up and to play the wrong move. If white would just take the bishop, which Carlson didn't in the game, black could play rook d8, and all of a sudden black has pretty strong counterattack here, because rook d1 is coming, and it may lead to even a back rank checkmate in some positions, and all of a sudden 
yeah, white's not winning anymore. It's actually not that easy for white to figure out what to do here. So instead of that, Carlson just boldly ignored the bishop and just played queen e5, just executing his plan. And after king went back, Carlson once again ignored the bishop, finally enough, and just played rook h4, saying, hey, I'm not caring about the bishop, I want the checkmate. And now black took on d5, because what else? And finally it led to this checkmate in three moves. So that's a really cool game, but especially the moment that I love the most from this game is that moment. Let me bring this on the board once again. So here's the absolutely mind-boggling moment from this game, where black just pushed their pawn to g5, threatening to push it further to g4 and to capture the rook. And instead of doing something against this threat, Carlson just calmly played king to h1, letting black to execute it, and after black played the move g4, again, instead of doing something about that, Carlson just played queen d4, bringing the queen out to a possibly vulnerable position and leaving the bishop undefended, so that's another extremely counterintuitive move, which is very hard to spot. And then after a pawn takes h3, all of a sudden Carlson sacrificed the other bishop by going bishop h6 and, you know, letting black to capture this bishop. So this series of a couple really brilliant and, you know, moves really shows that he certainly had what it takes to become a great chess player, because playing moves like that when you're 12 years old says that, yeah, definitely a guy has potential. You may wish to check out another video which I published recently, where it shows not only how Carlson crushed the Indian Grandmaster virtually in 10 moves, but how he played a very powerful opening gambit for black against the first move e4, so you may wish to check this out, or you may also wish to consider visiting my free masterclass out there to elevate your chess skills overall. Have a great rest of the day, bye!